let's let's make a start. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I can't tell you um, how excited I was to learn that SWD and Ivan in particular is thinking about putting together a program of these sorts of information sessions which I think is really beneficial for the organisation. If we're going to do you know, the best we possibly can, we really need to know that you know, the foibles and the, the idiosyncrasies of the, the people that we're dealing with on a fairly regular basis. So I was very excited to be asked and uh, I am very, very, I stand behind what we're trying to do very much. So today, I, it's one man's perspectives. Um, there is, please, I want to run this very informally. This is an opportunity to ask the questions, the hoary questions you've never felt empowered to ask. There are no holds on any questions in this gathering. Ask away. I'd rather you ask them and I will give it my best shot to answer. But bear in mind, this is, this is my view and my experience and uh, as you will find out during the course of this presentation, uh, there are many experiences and many different journeys and that, if nothing else, is what I'm wanting to impart with you today. So before I start the, uh, my talk, as it were, or, or providing with you a potential framework to gain some understanding of and some insights into how we might improve our interaction, with visually impaired uh, folk. I thought I might uh, just play a part of an interview which was on ABC Radio National, uh, Life Matters. Uh, it was with a, a guy called Ryan Knighton, um, who is an author who wrote a book about the journey of losing his sight. And it's, it's, uh, it's a really uh, powerful story because he uses humour quite, quite effectively to bring out the sorts of things that we as people in SWD need to be aware of when we're dealing with these folks. So it goes for, for 20 odd minutes. I will uh, only use about 10 minutes of it today, but uh, I think I might ask Amy just to uh, put on that interview if you might, Amy, please. Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. Do you know anyone who found being a teenager easy? I can think of some who made it look that way, but it wasn't really. It was just a good act. For my next guest, it was bloody hard because he was gradually going blind with something called retinitis pigmentosa. This made summer jobs and learning to drive a bit more interesting than it is for most people. These days, Ryan Knighton writes and teaches writing. He's written a memoir called Cockeyed. It's funny, it's wry, it's sometimes very angry. It's all about trying to ignore his worsening eyesight, then getting life into perspective, and eventually just getting on with it. Here, he recalls the moment, years before his diagnosis, when his uncle Brad noticed something. Yeah, we were we were sitting around the dinner table. Um, I, I grew up in a, a suburb of Vancouver in Canada called Langley, and it's kind of a farming area near the border of, of the United States. And my my whole family with my uncle were sitting around the table, and my uncle made this piratey face across the table at me, and you know, in this kind of stupid Popeye voice, he said, "R, you know, you be." You know, look at me with that that look. I'll take it off your face and stuff. And nobody knew what he was talking about. Well, it turned out I had a squint in my left eye. I had this kind of cockeyed look. And um, when I started writing the book, I was trying to find well, what is the first moment that that I, we knew something was wrong? And and uh, that was the slightest rumble of what was to come because I developed this squint because my eye was trying to focus through a little blind spot that I couldn't see yet. Um, so that that stuck as like the the first um, tremor really. You were fourteen then. Was there, were there any signs before that, or can you only, looking back, can you now make sense of other things? Well, it made sense of a lot when I was diagnosed, because I had, you know, I'd always been very clumsy, people thought. You know, I, I used to play sports and do things like that, but gradually into my teens, I stopped because I was just so clumsy, and uh, there was really never any sense of why that is, and... and uh, you know, when I was diagnosed at the age of 18 that I had my, my retinas slowly deteriorating, you know, it made sense of all sorts of stuff mm. in my past that used to be chalked up to just inattentiveness. And, I, you know, I could never understand things like how people could move so quickly through dimly lit restaurants or 
um, even how people drove drove cars at night. It just seemed to me so magical that people could stay on the right spot on the road. Night blindness is one of the the, the, the first things you had to deal with. But as you explain, actually, night blindness. It's sort of a, a handy phrase, but it doesn't really explain it, does it? No, and it's very hard for people to understand this and, and imagine it. But like, as you lose your sight, and, and in my case, it begins by going night blind. Um, that doesn't mean you don't see anything in the dark. What it means is you you can see, in my case, points of light. Like I could see street lights and headlights. The trouble being, I couldn't see anything they were intended to illuminate. So the points in between remain extremely dark. And so, you know, you don't have any in inclination to think that there's anything wrong because you can see lights like everybody else. Mm. And everybody else seems to have better abilities at inferring the missing bits that you're having trouble making out. And so you you have no no comparison really in your own eyes to say, oh, I'm seeing a lot less than other people. You just think you're clumsier than they are or you're more inattentive than they are. As I said when I was introducing you, you know, when you get your first holiday job, you're working in a warehouse. You, you, yeah. you want to drive the forklift. I want to drive the forklift. Any self-respecting teenage boy wants to drive the forklift. It is right? a, a matter of profound regret for me that I never got to do that. Oh, it and now so it wouldn't be as much fun because I'm more responsible. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, I had no no plans to ever go to university or you know become a writer. No, not at all. I, I grew up in a working class family. My dad was a welder. And uh, my my big plan was to drive the forklift, and and so to get a summer job when I was in my teens, where I got to drive a forklift, seemed to me like manna from heaven. Mm. You know, I can't believe it. And uh, yeah, what happened was I I just about ran over a guy with the forklift, and I I couldn't explain why that happened because he was so apparent to everybody else but me. And um, so to get out of it, as any any self respecting teenager does, I lied and I just said I had an eye problem. And uh, funny enough, three years later, it was true. Mm. So I kind of I diagnosed myself with a lie. But I mean, a forklift is one thing. The family car is another thing altogether. Yes, the car story. Well, you know, I had, um, and I should say this to your listeners that you know, it's not like I was out there knowing I was going blind and just trying to avoid it at everybody else's expense. When you're losing your sight in these small blind spots, your your brain infers the missing bits. And so you actually don't see holes in your visual field. It's it's not a visual idea. It's like looking at the floor with your feet. It's just not, you, there's nothing. You, you, you do the processing in the back of your head in to the back kind of, of build head. the picture up. So you don't know there's anything wrong. Yeah. Uh, and most people with my condition are actually diagnosed by car accidents. And, and in my case, I had about a dozen. Um, to pick from and I only wrote three of them so as a writer it was wonderful yes. I had this huge buffet to choose from of, of wonderful accident stories and I, I just chose three well you have to tell the the, the rock and vehicle Stonehenge incident I yeah think. It, I mean it's, and it was so I had a hard time with my editor to describe this story because it's, it's logistics are so strange but I was leaving a petrol station as you would call it uh, in, in the dark and I was driving home and it was it was very quickly after I'd had my driver's license and uh, I turned onto what I thought was a country road uh, but it turned out to be a patch of lawn that bordered the road and the problem with this lawn that I mistakenly thought was a road is that it was bordered by these large decorative boulders and so I, I impaled my father's car on, on one of them and made this kind of auto stonehenge and the gas jockeys were jeering and laughing at the the stupidity of what I'd just done. And, you know, I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. So I, I just gunned the car and launched it off the rock into the middle of the grass, which was fine, except then I discovered that the entire piece of grass was encircled by boulders. And so I'd been, you know, kind of isolated on this island in these rocks. So the only option that was available other than a crane was I just gun the car through the other side yeah <laughs> uh, which my father figured out in the morning when he saw his car surrounded by a pool of oil <laughs> yeah and all the time you're trying to pretend that uh, you know what you're doing yeah i'm trying and to pretend there's, there's no problem here i don't know if it's the same over here but in north america and in canada like you know there's a car is everything especially in one of those suburbs if you don't have one you just can't get anywhere and so I had just gotten my license, so there was no way I was going to come, come, you know, with my hands out and say to my parents, "I think there's something wrong," or "I, I can't drive very well." You just try and hide it as long as you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah, we're a car culture too. Your dad was furious about it, but but it must have been impossible for him to know that there was more going on than just, you know, bad testosterone-filled teenage driving. Yeah, and you know it's. They wouldn't have figured it out. I mean, I, the only reason I went to an eye doctor to get my eyes checked was because the, the last accident I had, 
I put my father's car in the ditch at five kilometers an hour. Now, any any teenage boy that puts his father's car in the ditch wouldn't have anybody look at him twice, but they would normally do it at 500 kilometers an yeah. hour. So the fact I did it so slow told them that there was something wrong because it was just not in character. Um, and I didn't really crash it. I kind of just parked it in the ditch. Uh, and yes, he had no idea what was going on. And he thought I was drunk driving because it was the only explanation available to him as to why I would do that. On Life Matters uh, today, if you've just joined us, my guest is Ryan Knighton, who's a, a writer, and he's a man who's been going blind uh, since boyhood and certainly adolescence, and he's written a memoir called Cockeyed. A year after diagnosis, you were, you'd were you gone, you'd pretty moved out of home, you'd gone off to Simon Fraser University. You were kind of in denial. Oh, well, very much. Not even kind of. <laughs> full, full, eight v, you know, full eight cylinders into denial. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it, it it's not like me. you started acting like you had a disability or anything like that. You you threw yourself into a social life. Well, and here's the hard bit is that, you know, you're going blind over a very long period of time. And I wouldn't want your listeners to misunderstand. This isn't a book about what it's like to be a blind man, because it's really about the twilight zone between being a sighted person and what I would now think of myself as a blind person. Mm. But it's a very long twilight zone where you can pass as either. And it's up to you to choose the moment you take on that identity. Uh, Because it's not like I woke up one day, hit over the head in the dark. You know, I I had to, at a certain point, say, okay, I need a cane. And even though I didn't use one yesterday, I need it today. Mm. And so those years uh, in the punk clubs and in university, I just wanted to see how long I could hide out in that liminal space and eke out that last little bit of being a guy who can get away with it. And nobody's going to tell me otherwise. You know, something from outside would have to force me to take up a white cane. And um, you, before you got to the cane, you lived with a, a young woman called Jane who was deaf. Mm-hmm. And she was to be, she was to become your girlfriend. But, mm-hmm. it, but it was never going to work out, really. No, you, you, it's funny. You can really see that one coming a mile away. <laughs> this is not going to work very well. And, you know, and we used to, you know, the phone would ring and I'd, I'd, I'd be saying to her, where's the phone? Where's the phone? And she'd say, food? What? You want some food? And it was just a completely dysfunctional sitcom. Um, but, you know, we hit out together in a good way. I mean, she she didn't like to go out too much. She found conversations in public difficult to follow. Mm. And that was convenient for me because it kept me from going out and bumping into stuff and, and feeling the the pressure of, of trying to keep up with the sighted world. So we, we really hit out together for a while and much to our, our, our mutual de- demise that way, you know. But she was she was um, the first person with a disability I ever knew. And, and she helped me hide out from my own for, for as long as I could. Mm. Anyway. When you did um, a, a bit later on opt for the cane, did you ever consider having a dog? No, because, you know, I I understood at least with a cane, I could hide it once in a while. You know, you can't put the, the German shepherd in your backpack when you don't want anybody to know. <laughs> right. No. And and so the cane has that, that wonderful camouflage. And actually in the United States, there's quite a debate amongst blind people about the politics of that. You know, that there's a, a certain group of very militant blind people who use these very long Merlin like staffs that don't break down like mine does into several segments. So they, because they feel that's still part of the shame of it is you want to be able to hide it once in a while. And so they take these very long, awkward staffs that, you know, when they sit down at a restaurant, they have to lay across three tables. And They're they're blind and proud, basically. But I don't, I've never considered the dog because I I understood that. And and I just understood I'm I'm too urban and and selfish and lazy to take out a dog four times a day and work it. And I don't think I could, I'd feel comfortable having one sit at my feet all day while I I write. Um, So it's never been an option for me. Eventually, you you went to South Korea with your um, then new girlfriend Tracy and to teach English. Mm-hmm. What was your relationship with you know losing your sight by then? Well, by that point, I was I was in my early twenties and um, I'd lost quite a bit of sight and I needed a cane at night without question and sometimes during the day if I if I was in an unfamiliar situation. But if I had an elbow, you know, somebody's elbow to guide me, um, I was fine. You wouldn't have known there was anything wrong with me even. Um, so I was at a very strange liminal point in my blindness where I could really get away with it sometimes. And sometimes it was dead apparent there was something wrong. And when we went to South Korea, we didn't tell them I was losing my sight because of course, who is going to hire a blind guy from overseas to teach children? Um, it just seems too complicated to sort out. So we wanted to make sure we had our best chances. So we didn't tell anybody Mm. and we thought we could hide it. 
you know, and and to to a great degree we did, but to our own demise over there because it really imploded our relationship. Having me hang on Tracy's elbow like a leather bag for six months, it just was really hard on us. But you well, you get through that, and you you come back from South Korea, and um, and then about nine years ago, you're procrastinating about something, and as one does when one is procrastinating, you decided to check your voicemails, and you yeah. got you got this terrible news. Yeah, on uh, I, I came back and I started teaching at a college, and I'd really finally kind of arrived in a comfortable place, and and Tracy and I had, had kind of amended what we'd destroyed in Korea, and. I was really in a comfortable spot, and then uh, I got a phone call one day, and, and my younger brother, who's five years younger than me, had, had overdosed. And um, it was a very complicated accident. He was living with a woman who was an addict, and she had stolen a bunch of pills. And he, he took two pills, and we don't know why he took them or what he thought they were, but he took two pills that ended up being liquid morphine. And, and so when he went to bed that night, he just never woke up. Mm. And it's not something you can call a suicide, and you can't call it... It's not like he was an addict himself and, and uh, he never had any history with that stuff. So what do you call it? There's not really a word for it other than an accident. It's complicated by the yeah. fact that he had, he'd, he'd struggled with depression. Yeah. So, you know, we really have this, this strange spot in our family where we have no answers and we can get no answers. And his, his partner at the time, the, his girlfriend, she's, she's given eight different versions of what happened in her own self-defense. And so there's... There's never any clear story. And, and in, a, in a weird way, my parents live with something that's like a kind of blindness where they have this one moment in their lives where they have no clarity whatsoever mm. and they have no point of reference for what what is the truth. And um, so they live with that every day in a, in a way that's, that I understand through my own body that, in that sense. You write um, there, I still remember him as the funniest person I've ever known, not the funniest person coping with depression. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing, isn't it? That some people will always define him by his troubles. Some people will always define you because mm-hmm. of because of your blindness. Yeah, and and you know we do that, right? I mean, you you take on these aspects of your identity, and you, they're pulled into the foreground, and they become the adjectives before you. You know, you're the blind writer. You're the the funny guy with manic depression. You're whatever the case. I find that, that, you know, having written the book, one of the things that's been good is it's allowed me to let blindness become part of who I am as opposed to the thing I write about. You know, I've written about it. It's done. And now I can use it as just part of me that is a perspective I have on things. It's it's the way I look out in the world, the same way right-handed people reach for the door with a certain direction. You mm. know, I just happen to look at things in a certain way. But so this, it's given me that. Yeah, but this, I suppose I'm talking about uh, when Rory died. Because you, you really stepped up. You, you did everything you could for your family on the practical front. Mm-hmm. And it was also the sort of moment where you let go of your sight. Yeah, there's this, there's this quality in my own story now that I, I, I saw when I, when I was writing it, which is, um, you know, I think everybody to degree struggles with self, whatever that thing is. It's like this constant warrior out of defining and figuring out who you are and struggling with whatever issues you have and things in your past. And when Rory died, there was an, this immense cure for self that happened to me because I now had to concern myself with others, you know, and take care of my parents. And, you know, no longer was I the one being guided around. I was trying to guide them through this and help other people. And, and it just opened up a space which allowed me to leave this little tiny riot cell I'd been living in, you know, this thing of where I was wrestling with blindness all the time. And suddenly it just didn't matter that much to me anymore. It just seemed so much smaller. And so, you know, it was the great cure for self. And it, it's a cruel thing to go through that as a way of curing yourself of those those wars. But um, that that was the backhanded gift of his death, is it, it gave me an escape route. We do end up towards the end with some very good news because you eventually marry Tracy. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right about that. You're right about um, her in a way, giving up something of herself to be with you. Yeah, she's the real mystery. I mean, Tracy and I have been together for for 12 or 13 years now, and and she's known me from when I didn't use a cane to where I am now, where I use it all the time and I don't read print or anything. And so she's seen that whole transformation, and she's consistently stayed attached to the man who evolved in front of her. I mean, I've become a very different person. 
Um, and I still think it's a great mystery that she wakes up every day and I, I didn't choose blindness, but she chooses to be inside that world. And, you know, it must be odd to get up in the morning and to have no image. Like she lives in a house that disappears her. And so, you know, what does it mean to go to the closet and choose your clothes? You know, what does it mean to live in a house where, you know, nobody looks at you? Mm. Uh, what does it mean to live with a guy who you have to put everything in words? You know, she can't just shoot me a dirty look when I'm doing something dumb. She's got to put it in words, right? And so it slows everything down that way. That's a good thing for you. I'm just thinking of my own relationship. <laughs> my wife can be so eloquent from 20 <laughs> feet away. Her face is incredibly eloquent, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, at the same token, you know, the thing that we, we learned and, and the, the bond that we have in our intimacy is in part born of understanding the virtue of failure. And so when I struggle, say, even at the kitchen table and I'm reaching for my glass and I can't find it and Tracy can see exactly where I need to go, mm. she doesn't immediately push it into my hand anymore because that creates a kind of dependence on for me and a kind of resentment of her at the same time that, that you know, I would have found it eventually. Yeah. But she'll watch me, which is hard to do. She'll watch me struggle an inch away from it for a while. And if I give up and ask for help, then she does. And if I fail and I don't ask for help, she just lets it go. Um, so she understands a kind of boundary that we need between caretaker and lover or, or wife and mother or nurse and friend, you know, that kind of thing. And caretaker, I mean, you're a caretaker yourself now because you've, you've written about this, about be, becoming a father. Yeah, I'm working on a memoir about becoming a blind dad right now. And, and uh, it's a whole other ball game now. You know, I thought I got this stuff licked, you know, and I learned how to become responsible for my body and myself in a way that suited the kind of person I am. And now I've got to figure out how to be responsible for somebody else with my body. And um, let me tell you, it's a weird thing when a baby is four months old and uh, I came upstairs one day and I said to Tracy, I'm going to take Tess for a walk uh, by myself. And that was the first time I'd done anything on my own with Tess. Mm -hmm. And it was very weird, you know, to have Tracy sit there and, and realize that she was uncomfortable with her own husband taking, you know, mm -hmm. his daughter for a walk. And I swear she, she didn't walk behind us the whole way, but I'm sure she really wanted to sneak quietly behind us. Uh, but I, you know, I strapped the baby on into the baby carrier and walked outside and, uh, it took me an hour to go around the block. I was so paranoid about bumping into stuff with yeah. my chest. It was like sweaty dynamite on my chest. You know? <laughs> and the first two people we walked by were two women that were talking and they got beside me and you know how people do that. As soon as they're past you, they think they can't, you can't hear them anymore. Yeah. But I heard one said to the other, my God, that's gotta be tricky. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so that's where we are now. You know, we're in this world of trying to figure out how to be responsible for her and at the same token not, you know, occlude me from all the things that a father does, you know. Well, after reading uh, Cockeyed, I'm actually very much looking forward to reading. I think it's going to be called Little Light of Mine. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, memoir, a memoir of a blinkered daddy. A memoir of a blinkered daddy. Well, Ryan, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks very much. And Ryan Knighton's book, Cockeyed, a memoir comes from Atlantic Books. I wanted to um, just play that little bit of the interview with you because it, it, well, that, it sort of provides another perspective of that, but I might add that it is so insightful as to the sorts of issues that you need to traverse while you're going through this process of learning to be blind. And in his own way, I thought it was useful to bring those things out. I have stories just like that where you don't tell people you're blind because you might be seen to be different and not get the job that you want. It's it, that was that was your life in that space. So I guess I guess what this sort of begins to point to, it, it, it gives you signposts as to some of the dimensions that you're actually dealing with when you are uh, working with or engaging with visually impaired people. But it also probably points to more questions than it does provide answers. There's no silver bullet, there's no one fit, sort of one size fits all answer to it. So I guess a good place to start is to actually get some sort of definitional sort of foundations to underpin this discussion. So we often hear the terms visual impairment and blindness. And what, what the hell does that mean? Well, visual impairment is sort of any limitation or one or more limitations of a function in the eye system and in essence visual impairment as it is defined really can be 
uh, along three dimensions. One, the sharpness or clarity of your sight or your visual acuity. The second is the scope of your normal vision or your vision field. And third is, is colour. And so from that definition alone, you get the sense or understand that what we're dealing with under that is anyone that might be short-sighted or long-sighted and using glasses, they're visually impaired, right through to the other end of the spectrum, which is full blindness, not being able to see light, dark or anything, and all manner of manner in between. So what we then begin to sort of work out is, well, what, what does legal blindness actually look like? Well, legal blindness provides us a little bit more definition, but as you'll see, it doesn't give us a whole heap of sense as to what we're dealing with either. So in Australia, legal blindness is defined as a visually impaired person who, with, the aid, with or without the aid of glasses or contact lenses, is unable to see at six metres what a person who is not visually impaired can see at 60 metres. So that's this notion of six slash 60, and uh, as against the sort of 2020 site in the, in, the, uh, in the imperial sort of measurements. So from that definition, we're talking about a population of individuals that have 10% of the vision that most people enjoy, and that labels them as legally blind. But again, that does not give you a whole heap of clarity as to what you're dealing with. And this is the challenge for us all when we are dealing with people that are legally blind because they have different symptoms and different stories and different journeys and different ways of coping with it. So for us, you know, I, I muse on the fact that we are likely to come across folk that have been blind from birth as against those who have been blind just recently. My story is I lost, I've basically been transitioning, as Ryan was talking about in that interview, from 1995, where I was basically told at that stage I had two years of sight left and to get my affairs into order. Thankfully at that stage, uh, they knew the end game, but their trajectory was all wrong. But in 2015, I wore the consequences of that uh, diagnosis and fully appreciated what it was. On the other side of the fence, you have people that have been blind since birth. I well remember a, a conversation I had with Professor Ron McCullum, who was a Senior Australian of the Year, uh, Dean of Law at, the, uh, at Sydney University and an eminent uh, industrial lawyer in Australia. And he kindly gave of his time to sort of uh, spend some time to explain to me how to set up an office for a non-sighted person, because that was what I was embarking on. And during this very generous conversation, he basically indicated to me that, or he mused, that he felt he was extremely lucky because he had been blind since birth and he, had, he didn't know what he didn't know. He had nothing to grieve or to, um, or to feel that he was being cheated out of. His life was a blind life. In a way, he was comfortable in his skin. That's not to say that there weren't challenges along the way, but that was his existence. Whereas what he, what he mused was he didn't want to be me because he felt that I had a sighted life, I then had to cope with the notion of that transitioning and then coming up with the notion of what it is to be blind and how do you fit into that world. Funnily enough, at that time, because we ended up in quite a debate about this, I, I absolutely agree the notion of losing one's sight sucks with a capital S. But by the same token, I felt extremely grateful that I had had the opportunity to see the magnificence and grandeur of human and natural systems around the world, to have seen the colour and movement and to know what a ship looks like and know what a bus looks like and all those, all those sorts of things, that at least it is a stepping stone into that non-sighted life. So there's neither right nor wrong in there, but in the process what I'm asking you to sort of think about is that behind that is the emotional underpinnings that we need to be aware of. I guess as well, by definition, we're going to be engaging with folk that are legally blind, that have no sight, and those that have limited sight. 
And I well remember a couple of years ago um, on a Winds of Joy program, we brought in some blind children from uh, southwestern Sydney and they came in on a Congo line and uh, got onto Kale. And the single most um, memorable sort of thing that I got from when they first worked, worked on was the weight of the world on these young shoulders. And it was clear as we went out sailing that some of them had sight and they were quite challenged by the fact that I couldn't see the mast or the, or the light or, or the water or you know the front of the boat or the back of the boat. So they were going to be my eyes for the day, which they got a kick out of. But that wasn't, what, that wasn't what was the weight that I'm talking about. It was the fact that they were different to their peers at that time of life. They were being outed because they were different. And I really am challenging you all to think about the importance of sort of the importance of self-esteem, uh, uh, self-worth, um, self-image and how damaging that can be if not channeled in the right directions. And it's, it's a very difficult, difficult thing to do. The third dimension that I would also just raise with you is that the type of eye disorder is correlated with the type of behaviour that you will witness from the blind person in front of you. It amuses me, and I'm sure it will you eventually when I t finish the story, when I first undertook my um, white cane training with guide dogs, I was sitting down with some of the instructors and they were musing that they, with high degrees of certainty, could work out how challenging the clients they were working with based on their eye disorder. And it turned out that those with tunnel vision or retinitis pigmentosa, just like um, Ryan was talking about, and symptoms that I wore myself, were unholy messes when it came to trying to train. They were in denial, uh, they wouldn't ask for assistance, they wouldn't take advantage of the aids that were available to make their lives easier. They were independent and, um, you know, as he said, denial with eight cylinders. And I'm sure it might amuse you to know that that was me very much so. In fact, it got to a stage with the training where they wouldn't take me out unless it was in the pitch black of night into, with no lights around and I had to start learning the skills to cope with what was coming down the line. So, again, you're going to have those that are more sort of accepting and challenging, and on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have this real denial, total independence, um, I can do it, all those sorts of attitudes coming through. And we need to be aware that, that you know, that's the sort of spectrum we're dealing with. So. How do we sort of make sense of that with the positions that we are engaging with? You know, both with volunteers, you with me, and other blind volunteers we have in the organisation, and of course the blind uh, participants that we have. And I sort of, from a blind person's perspective, the way in which I have channeled my, the, the way in which I address it, and I, I hope it might sort of assist you in sort of addressing it, is I, I, I channel the three stages of development that Stephen Covey talks about in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where he talks about the stages of dependence, independence and interdependence. And in a funny way, that can be mapped over the journey that Ryan was talking about in that interview, and I can definitely share with you in terms of my journey to blindness, because you mirror what Covey was talking about, his book, you know, being the baby and the young child, you were utterly dependent on the adults and parents around you to keep you safe, provide the food, water, um, comfort, all the, the sort of uh, physiological Maslow needs that we, we talk of. Um, we then move to a stage in teenagehood where we sort of strike out where we want to be independent, where we're not going to be told how to do things, where we pay more attention to peers, all of that type of gear. And at some stage, some of us actually reach a point where we recognise our limitations, whether it be in our personal, social or working lives, where we're going to be more when we start working with and through people to get to, to, you know, get to where we're wanting to be. In a, in a way, that's the, the, the journey of blindness. You know, for the person that is 
blind and struggling to come to terms with it, they're going to be utterly dependent. Our interactions with them are going to be more supportive and comforting. With, with, with that sort of basis, we might be able to work them into that space where we can give them the, empower them to think about that they can do things and gain some independence with some of those sorts of things. For those that are independent, we can challenge, we can work them, we can um, ch ask them questions about what they can and can't do. We can work out with them what their, what their boundaries are in terms of being able to do things. And through that, we can then move them into that next stage, which is interdependence and working out that if they want to achieve things, then they might be able to do that more effectively by working with and through people. No clearer example of that than me on the, on the boat. And I think you will all have seen that. Um, I definitely ha have an independent streak in me. But I definitely know that if I'm wanting to do the things that I want to do in my, in my sailing life, I need to work with people to make sure that I cover off my limitations and they're aware of them. And as I've journeyed over the last three years, that's been part of the learning for me and those around me. So that's the sort of way in which I make sense of, of how I deal with the various dimensions of the folk out there. But I, I think to really get to some some grips with what we're really talking about we need to go a little bit deeper one step deeper and I think it really comes to questions about well what is sight and in the 80s late 80s early 90s or thereabouts um, the BBC did a wonderful documentary documentary called the brain story and one of the episodes on that talked about uh, sight and it really resonated with me because it explained so much that hadn't been answered before. And what this Professor Anne Greenwood in this investigation and musings on the mysteries of the mind was hypothesising on was, um, are we seeing or are we dreaming? Now, at first brush, you think, oh, that's fanciful and far out and just a little bit wah-wah for me. But it's not until you actually look at the science and the evidence behind it that you actually begin to get a real glimpse into the underbelly of what, what we're actually dealing with. And they looked at a range of sort of experiments that sort of began to challenge what we are actually seeing. And I can remember two very clearly. Uh, the first one was being, and I'm sure some of you might have seen this, was... Um, there was a uh, basketball game in the United States, big auditorium, lots of people in the auditorium watching these, te these teams go hammer and tong at each other. And through the course of the game, a bear danced through it at, for quite long periods during the course of the game. On the exit out of that, people were asked about how they enjoyed the game and was there anything you know particularly noteworthy about it or unusual about it and a large proportion of the people had not even seen the bear dancing through the floor when they're all looking oh, sorry, sorry when they're all looking at the uh, at the game so we're not really seeing all that we think we're seeing the second uh, experiment that really uh, plays into this space was um, they were looking at bank <laughs> customers going into a bank branch and walking up to the teller to do the transaction with the teller. Uh, you might be struggling to do that in this day and age, but there you go. In the past, that was, that was the way in which it was done. And the transaction was undertaken by a person who midway through would uh, ostensibly drop something behind the counter, disappear from sight, and an entirely different person would finish the transaction. On an exit interview, a large number of people again were asked about the quality of the service and was there anything about the service that was noteworthy and many of them had not even noted that there was a change of person and in some instances it was a change of sex as well, that <laughs> finishing it. So, so again we must challenge what we are actually seeing and what we think we are seeing. And so what what became very clear through this episode was that sighted people with normal sight use memory and the function of the brain to complete pictures. It's like random access memory with your computer. It completes things for you. 
And the more you see of something, so what, they've, what they're sort of hypothesising now is that most people will see between 40 and 60% of what they actually believe they see, and your brain, your memory, will complete the picture for you. So when you actually think about that, and how well you get around, or not, and we overlay that and start looking at what a legally blind person is doing in there. So let's go back to the definition. They see 10% of what you, as a normally sighted individual, will see. They then will see 40 to 60% of that 10%, and their brain will attempt to f finish the images. So it's no wonder that they're walking into things, bumping into tables, knocking their heads, all the stuff you see me doing on a daily basis. So again, it really points to the importance of the brain, this dream state that they're hypothesising on, completing the things to enable you to go about your life. So the importance of memory to normally sighted persons to do the job to the best that they can do is critical, but then for the people that are blind around you, it's more than critical. And we'll come back to that when we sort of talk about the boats and things like that. So, what are the take home messages from this? Because that's really what I want to get to, because I'm not providing you with the answers, I'm providing you with some of the sorts of things that we need to be tapping into. The first observation I'd make is that within every blind person, there's a sighted person wanting to get out. And by that, I mean that beneath that, they're going to be dealing with uh, all manner of emotions and dealing with <laughs> that sighted person trying to struggle out of the existence they have with their non-sighted lives. I guess that then leads on to my second observation, which is that... I think we need to be mindful and avoid at all costs just dealing with the symptoms that we are seeing before us. Yes, they're going to be challenged and struggles with the, with the, the lack of vision and the things that, that emanate from that. But the person behind that is often more the issue that we need to be engaging with and talking to and empowering, and empowering them with the possibility of optimism and breaking the shackles of what confront them. The third observation I would make is that you, we all need to be mindful of the importance of mental maps and memory for blind people to do what they do. And anything we can do to assist in that space will assist in the value that they can add to the activity that you are charged with or that you were engaged with doing. The fourth and final observation that I would make is that ask questions, lots of questions and never assume. Because it comes back to that notion of what is blindness. I think what I want you to walk away with today is that there is no one size. You are going to be, you are going to be dealing with all, all types of blindness. And it's only through the dialogue that you enter into and finding out the challenges that they face and working out the ways that you might be able to work with them around those challenges that we then begin to have the impact that we want and aspire to do at SWD, that we can break down the shackles that they face, that we can imbue them with that sense of optimism and positivity that we, uh, we, we talk about um, and are wedded to. So I guess that is the background, the context. Are there any questions on any of that from, please, ask away? Because it's, in a sense, I'm not providing you with the answers, I'm providing you with a, some of the dimensions that you might need to be aware of, if, if not already aware of. Okay. Let me ask one if I could. Yeah, please. Go. What tricked you over from losing sight to getting on a boat? and they're going to do that same. So you, you took a big forward step there to say, actually, I'm going to step onto a boat and go and become a real sailor now. What got you to take that step? It comes back to that Windsor Joy, Joy program again about that is self-esteem, self-identity, self-worth. Yeah. And um, I used to play A-grade sport, um, cricket, tennis, hockey. Um, 
So anything eye-hand coordination was pretty good. Yeah. Um, so my identity, at least in my eyes, was in a, inextricably tied up in that sporting person. Yeah. And I wanted... It was, I felt it was important for me to find a sport that I would be able to participate in, given my disability, to get the competitive juices flowing again. And I had undertaken dinghy sailing on Lake Burley Griffin as a teenager. And I felt that there was a possibility on yachts, where there were a team of individuals around me, that I might be able to show my value to those around me. That was what took that step into the sailing community again. And that has been the rewarding experience for me because um, the, the journey from that, that pig-headedness and self, and, you know, um, independence that was so important to me, I at that time recognised that I'd reached the end. I d defined my way out of existence. As that, as that RP person, yeah. You cope with it by, as your visual field reduces, you define your life to maintain the image of normality. And that works for a long time, but at some point, you're defining yourself out of life. So the step for me was to put myself into situations where I could work with people to achieve the outcomes I wanted. Hence so. Thanks. Anything else? Cool. Must be doing a real good job then. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess now I'd just like to get more into the sort of some of the the practicalities of of the the life that we lead. And I guess the first the first point that I would like to just embark as a as a point of dialogue with you is um, the, the the process of mobility and aid people that need to be given some assistance in mobility. The first point for me, and this as sailors you should have no problems with this whatsoever because we know starboard and port, we know the bow, we know we use the clock face to describe where things are. You should all be able to help me orientate myself in my life on the boat or wherever I am perfectly because you've got the notion of the clock face and it's all orientated off myself. In front of me is 12 o'clock and everything else follows. My darling mum at 80, 80, mid 80s or late 80s still struggles with this and she's providing an orientation from where she's facing and we end up in an awful mess <laughs> because she's saying 12 o'clock and I'm reaching away saying it's not there. So it's, it, it really, it, it's, it's humorous but it's, it's that simplicity of Putting yourself in that person's shoes and orientating them is will overcome a whole lot of embarrassment for both parties as we work work our ways through it. I guess the second uh, thing that most people struggle with is how do we go about providing assistance to people that might be very independent, pig-headed and in denial. And I guess where I get to with that is make the offer. It is amazing how many people just grab you and take you. They don't offer the shoulder or the elbow. I think that where you can soften this, uh, some people do this just naturally. They talk about, oh, there's people coming up. Would you like an arm or a shoulder? Oh, well, yes, please. That would be great. And you just walk on. With that, you then become the eyes of that person so that it does become incumbent upon you then to be aware of the sorts of things that might act as an impediment on that. I think many of you will have heard David talking about um, Kurt Watson after a, uh, a night out down in Hobart for a Sydney to Hobart asking one of the crew if he could have a shoulder, and he said, no problems, and he promptly walked him into a signpost. <laughs> Easily done, but if you're going to take the responsibility, just be mindful that you're providing some intelligence on that, on that place. Another area which seems to cause a great deal of embarrassment 
is um, assisting people to their seats. Now, a lot of people will walk you up beautifully in terms of addressing the situation and then say a chair is right in front of you. Now, a chair can be many things. There might be arms on it, it might be low, it might be high, it might be a swivel chair, whatever. But there's one thing that's always going to be a, a pretty much a consistent. Moving your hand and just placing it on the back of the chair and we can work it out from there. So rather than saying it's over in front of you, just putting the hand on the chair, back of the chair, and we are well worse with what, how, how to navigate from there. Um, I guess another one, which may not be mobility, but it's, it's nonetheless something that is painful because um, for me, for many of you, I know your voices, and I can hear your voice, and I recognise you. And I'm not. For those I'm not so familiar with, or when there's noisy rooms and the like, I might not recognise who the hell it is, and it's rather embarrassing trying to work out how it is that I'm going to find my way. Now I turned into a bolsh, and I just say, "Who the hell are you?" <laughs> but it's nonetheless just, you know, good form. That hi James, it's whatever, and bang. I'm locked in and away we go. Going back to mobility, I guess, um, are there any questions about any, any of those sorts of things or issues that you've struggled with in dealing with that? Or? The general one, and has, this will have to come from you, is if you've got new people are coming at the boat, you haven't seen them before, you haven't interacted with them before, and you've got, you could have, they could be incredibly independent yep. or incredibly they want to be looked after. Yep. Trying to get I guess you've got to just you've got to just talk to them for a while. But trying to get there without doing the wrong thing, either pushing them too hard or not talking them enough, I find difficult from my point of view. So trying to sort that out is something that with anybody with a disability, I find a little bit difficult until you get to know them. Absolutely, and it look. The only advice from the non-sighted person that's probably the worst offender of all of this in his past life is just ask the open question. You know, it's if they don't want it, we can only then watch and be be there to assist them. I believe. Uh, I think it's 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 also, um, you know, you can now you can actually provide the context for them in in verb in in words as well. So, you know, find out what they can and can't see. So some people will be able to see the boat. Will be able to see the the uh, step into the KL, they will be able to see the gap there, so they're going to be quite able to that. They're, they're suffering in, a, in what they can't see in their periphery. You know? But I think it is a question of just being fearless and asking open questions and being not taking it personally when you shut down. That's all I could offer to that space. It's not easy. They're struggling with their own identities and... Um, it's a, it's a rough journey that they're going to be embarking on. In a similar vein, I can remember the first time, probably about a year ago, that I sailed with you, and I hadn't been with S SWD very long, um, and we got on a boat, sat down, and um, you happened to be sitting next to you, and you said, um, hi, I'm James, and I said, hi, James, I'm Clive, and then everyone starts getting on with stuff, and the next thing I knew, um, you weren't there, and... Um, I think you disappeared down down below, and there was talk about clearing some water up from either the bilges or some dodgier water from around the toilet, and we're all getting on with our job, with our various jobs. The next thing I know, you're standing at the top of the companionway with this clear container of really dodgy looking liquid, um, and no one was pretty sure what it was, and no one seemed to be taking it off of you. So I sort of reached over, um, but there was a lot going on, put my hands in front as if to take it for you to pass it to me and you weren't passing it to me and I said give it to me but I don't think you could actually locate where I was and so I'm thinking I'm asking this guy to pass it over to me <laughs> what, like what's the problem yeah. and I was just about to do say something which could have certainly embarrassed me and made me look very stupid when someone sort of leaned in my ear and said Clive James is blind I thought, okay, right, now I understand that I've got to go and get this, but like, I didn't know that. And um, File that one away when we do come to the boat, because I'm not going to provide the insights, I'm going to ask you the questions. Mm. And 
that points to something in terms of when we are racing or sailing and, and divulging our abilities and disabilities. Mm. I think it's a really important thing, mm. but I, I'll leave that aside. And that was sort of a banal example, but it could have yep. been in a, quite a serious situation, I yep. guess. Is the well, another one of David's friends the other day was uh, laying fenders on whatever when we came back in and said, he was asked me, so is this the right height? I said, I don't know, I can't see. Mm. And that wasn't his fault. <clears throat> he just hadn't been told. Mm. That talks to actually something that is wrong with the way if we are dealing with non-sighted people, it's important that we're all aware of who they are and what their limitations are and you know what their abilities are. To. Um, any, anyone else? It's Any the question on, yeah. on lending an elbow, as you say, or a hand. Yep. If, if I come across a, a, a person with a, with a stick, yep. trying to get off the train or whatever, Yep. Um, assuming I'd uh, offered an elbow, after a while, um, you know, I've got my own business to go to, and 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 um, you want is to there a polite way of saying, well, you know, you're on a <laughs> you're on a level track now. You're on your own now. You're on your own. See ya. So, <laughs> so so where are you heading to? I'm actually heading that way. I guess is the way to okay, break it. Okay. Yeah. So it's just it's more conversational and and not to get um, to too tied up with. I mean, it's, it's more part of a conversation, I think. And, you know, I, it's, it's funny, um, it never amazes, it never ceases to amaze me how many folk offer that assistance and in, at certain times it is absolutely invaluable and at other times I just thank them very, very much. Um, but in all cases, don't stop doing it because it's, it's uh, incredibly... Don't stop, don't stop. Don't stop offering because it's in there are it's incredibly uh stressful in many you know situations finding a way around the city and the like um and often you know with traffic lights they don't have the uh the, the bips so you don't know what's going on and it it does become an issue and often you'll see them try to trying to work out where the hell, hell they are. That's me often, because they, they're trying to use GPS, and GPS in the city doesn't work. So it's 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 a... The, don't stop asking. So even with a dog, you could you could use some help? Oh, absolutely. It, the, the dog, the dog, and I'll talk to, talk about the dog in a moment. It's The dog will keep me from um, getting into really narky areas, but they won't know where they are in the city. They it, and I'll talk to that in a moment. So, are there any other questions about just assisting or? Yeah. Like well, my first interaction with Kathy was in this room, and you introduced her. Hi, I'm James, and you said I'm blind. And then right after that, you were looking for something on the table, and that 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 was it. That moment. What the hell do I do? Do I show him where it is, or do I let him find out where it is? And you finally did. And I remember asking Liz at the time. I'm like Liz. I just came to the situation, what do I do? She's like, look, just, he, he will ask for help yeah. if he wants it. That's, a, that's, that's the yeah. truth. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if it is yeah. clear that they're nowhere near it, yeah. offer it. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, I've got a responsibility in this yeah. too. Yeah. And that's part of the learning I've got to, <coughs> I've got to take on. Yeah. Okay. Well, there was a simple one. You and I were in the room not so long ago, and you, and you dropped your, headphone, uh, your earphones on the floor. You are packing up to leave. You had no idea it was there. So, you know, if you don't point things out to them, yep. they're, they're not going to know that you have something. Absolutely. But I have, I have a question. Yep. Um, apart from the obvious one of you trying not to fall overboard, which we appreciate, <laughs> what are your two most difficult things to cope with on the boat? Okay. Can I come to that? Because I am going to set up a whole section on okay. the boat. Fine. I will come to it. Anything else in just terms of the assistive stuff? Yeah, well, this would relate to the dog. You were going to talk more about the dog, but I, my understanding is that you shouldn't, um, a stranger shouldn't react with a dog because they, they concentrate. In fact, I saw a sign on a dog, please don't pat me or something, yep. I'm, I'm working or whatever yep. it was. So if I were to offer assistance to somebody trying to cross the road, I'm going to distract that dog. No, but you're not interacting with the dog, you're interacting with the person. So the dog's okay with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's part of their working, their working context. All right. So 
So they use two people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and we control the dog with with the harness and the, the leash and the, the word commands and the like. Okay, so I'll, I'll just move on to some of the mobility aids so that we just, any questions that you have with that. So the, the first one that you obviously see me working around with is with the uh, long white cane. Um, this is a hit and crash through type of technology. Um, it looks incredibly cumbersome, but it is one of the most resolved pieces of technology to this day that I have in my arsenal. Uh, it gets me around safely, um, and it, it's, hit, it's hitting things. That's the way you engage with the world. So it's a very tactile way of engaging, and it looks awful, but it actually really does work. The other advantage of the cane is that while for me it provides me with a sense of my immediate surrounds in front of me and where I'm going, it also signals to those around me that, hey, they better look out. No clearer example of that is when I first hit the city in my new working life down here and walking through Wynyard Station at peak hour and I was being buffeted from, you know, here, there and everywhere and I thought, fuck at this. I began waving the cane around wildly <laughs> and thereafter I cut a sway straight through. So it was a signal to others to be clear of this madman and I'm sure I was known as the madman in, in Wynyard Station. But you get the picture. It serves two purposes. Um, I think, uh, other than that, unless anyone has any questions about specifically cane, cane use, that really captures the essence of it. So it's, it's very effective, um, but they, you can get yourself dis disorientated with that. <coughs> and the cane will only assist you in trying to work out um, a context that is fairly safe and getting out of it. It won't help you orientate. So please ask is, is the important part. To the dog, um, they are amazing creatures. Um, I am a recent, um, uh, uh, Panther has only recently come into my life. Um, and the way I would describe the dog, like, sorry, like Ryan Knighton was saying, for a long time I didn't want a dog because I couldn't fold up the dog. I could fold up the cane and I could be normal, at least for the, for, it was important to me. Um, but when you reach that point where I am blind and I've got to deal with the blind and all that sort of thing, I wanted to get flow back into my mobility. So the cane is great, but it is crashed through. You know, you feel things, you tap things, you make noise, you frighten people. It's amazing. People don't, don't engage with you with a cane. With a dog, entirely different. But with a dog, you get flow back. They move you through the, the traffic. Uh, keep you safe. Um, the the thing that I'd to to sort of dispel some of the urban myths about them. They when I completed my training, I honestly thought I would have panther and we'd sail off into the sunset and you know just in, hit the world and we'd be right. It's not like that at all. It is a, a true partnership. There is true interdependence. It is a a true symbiotic relationship. Because what you are actually working in is, with the dog is working out each other's strengths and weaknesses and then using their strengths to overcome my weaknesses and vice versa. So it's a true partnership and it takes a long time to actually build that trust and that understanding of each other in, in the urban context or the context that we find ourselves. So uh, as, is it Fred? Yeah. Yeah, as Fred was saying, um, if you see a dog in harness, do not interact with it at all. You will talk into the individual and engaging with the individual, no problems whatsoever. Do not engage with the dog at all. They are working. And the last thing we're wanting them to do is to get out of that working habit mm. by having people sort of G them up with pats and in their ears and gooing and all that type of stuff or, or offering them bits of pie and all that type of stuff. <laughs> it, ha it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, people just come up and just <coughs> take, you know, they believe that I've donated to guide dogs, therefore I'm entitled to. No, you're not. It's, it's really, really important. On the flip side, when he's out of harness, for me, he's a dog. He's a big, buffy Labrador and he loves people and he's, he loves you and... <coughs> 
show all the affections and can be given all the affections of any other dog. Just when he's in harness, don't go there. Any questions about that? Just a quick one. When, okay, if you've got a stick, it's very tactile. Yeah. If you've got a dog, things like gutter steps or bumps in the path, yep. do they give you an indication of that? Or yep. So with, with um, gutters, they will basically, they're trained to uh, step up onto it and stop. Or when they're coming the other way, they'll stop at the gutter. And then step down and you follow the, follow the thing. Um, with hazards, they will generally take you around them. So where there's uneven pavement, they generally won't do that. But uh, where there are hazards like poles and, and, uh, or cones and that type of stuff, they, they just take you around and, and follow on. It's, it's one of the most um, liberating experiences to, to know that I can get across a car park, enter a car park with one path and the dog will take me across the car park and enter the, the path on the other end, where with a cane you have no idea. That's the beauty of it. How long was your training? Before, before taking the dog. Yeah, so the, the dog, so I'll start. The, the dog spends 18 months with puppy raisers, and they, they're basically really uh, socialised in all manner of, of context, and uh, developed with household obedience and that type of stuff. So that's as far as they take it. Yep. Then the dog will go in for 22 weeks of intensive training, and it's that time they are determined whether they're going to be a guide dog, or special needs or a companion dog. And so it's when they reach the, the level of guide dog, they have shown the right temperaments, the right attitudes, the right... They've really reached the, the top of their game. But uh, after that 22 weeks, they then uh, pair them up with the client. So the client is also assessed in terms of their, their gait, their personalities, all that sort of stuff. So there's a, there's a pairing up on that level. I then went in for an intensive two-week course out at Penrith Panthers. Um, and then they spent another two weeks with me on site, so a week in and around Barrel, and then a week getting in and out of Sydney to enter the yacht club, and all, you know, navigating through uh, Central Station and, and all that type of stuff. At the end of that four weeks, you are given basically a uh, a tick, and you know, good luck, yeah. and here's the phone number, and we'll be right by your side should you need us. Now, for many of you, you might recall, sorry, I'll just, just continue. You might recall uh, early on in Panther's life, he was a uh, group of kids ran over the top of him going down the escalators at uh, Edgecliff Station. And he was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I find out afterwards that they lose many guide dogs from that sort of behaviour because he just lost confidence. He lost confidence about going on escalators, couldn't get him on there, which is a real trouble with... as. Renee would know, uh, many of the railway stations, that's the way you get in and out of them. And so, Guide Dog spent another week with me, and we went to um, Macquarie uh, Square, out of, uh, sorry, MacArthur Square, and we spent weeks just riding escalators, travelators. Now you can't stop him, he loves it. <laughs> but but th thankfully, he regained his confidence, and They've had to sort of say, you know, retire dogs at a very early stage for this sort of stuff. Sorry, you were saying? Well, the follow-up is you talked about a, forming a symbiotic relationship. With yep. Him. How long did it take you to get that to a level that it was kind of, he was functional, you know, <coughs> the pair of you were functional? At a very rudimentary level, I would say, at the end of that training when they first left, we, we and you it was that. every day we went out and worked, you know, different parts of it. And the fact that I'm coming into the city two or three times a week, we're riding the trains, the escalators, the walking down New South Head Road, we're riding buses and taxis and so he's getting all that reinforced all the time. Yeah. And so it's it's it and it's building that confidence all the way through. So now I have a quite remarkable dog, I so. say. Yeah. Mm. So how long have you been together now? We are coming up for two years. Oh, okay. Mm. And does he know your routes? So if you're going to the station or going wherever he, he Remembers those and takes you on. Yeah, he does. It's it's. Uh, but but if if I were to change the route, he adapts. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then he's more listening to my signal. So I've got to be aware where I am in relation to it and have a mind map of where that. So my mind maps are all important in that as yeah. well. Um, it's it's funny. I I I get off the bus stop in town every day. He knows as we walk all around. He's 
he's looking at, you know, the, my favourite bakery and coffee shop and uh, <laughs> the chemist and the barber and the bank and the, and no, not today, mate. And we keep going, and yeah. so he's 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 really tapped into that sort of gear. But it's funny, um, just to to roll on from that, it's it's very isolating with a cane because people stand off, and it might be because of the way we wave it around. But with a dog, it's it's unbelievable how how people will engage with you. You know, if I come down on the train now without the dog, it's it's where's the dog? Is he all right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm all right, thank you. It's yeah, nice. <laughs> so it's it's quite a different relationship that I'm having with those people around me now. Yeah. It's more involved and more, which is an interesting. Yeah. interesting and I ask about the escalator, given that it's the sort of normal stand on the left when you're going down in case somebody's in a hurry. Do you stand next to the dog, or do you get him to stand behind you in front? Of him? Yeah, so, so you would be blocking the. The Correct. Lane, so to speak. Correct. So the way in which I've overcome that is I step around and protect him on one side and round the front, and I face back up. Now I can't see Diddley squat, but I'm glaring at whoever's coming down. <laughs> so they, they they know that it's. I don't know. We didn't get to the bottom. Uh, I just I just hope like hell I'm. <laughs> it. But it, it, but it's it, I haven't I haven't had troubles with that yet. But right. it's it's it, but that's the way in which I. So you do leave a clear path there. Absolutely, absolutely. So how do you actually, if you're going from here to the station or you want to change a difference, how do you actually get the dog to go where you want it to go? Is it part mind map and you're directing a little bit? Or yes. Or, okay. I have, to, I, as I say, it's, it's that the importance of mind mapping, and I keep coming back to that as, as a, all I see is light and dark now, so I... I need to be aware of my surroundings and I'm picking that up in terms of the sounds of the open spaces and that and I need to know where where they relate to and then take the dog sort of and use the dog to navigate those spaces safely. Okay. So you don't say I want to go to the station and he goes to the station to sort of okay. That's, that was the question yep. I was leading to. Yeah, yeah. So it's more it's more directed, so it's part of that partnership. But once we are at those traffic lights at Barrel Railway Station, he knows where we're going. When we're heading out the frontier, he knows where we're going, up New South Head Road and down that. And all the ladies at the, at the checkouts there, they all know him. And they're opening gates and so on. So it's a, it's a, funny, it's a funny world. James is wrong. Um, what happens when you get yourself disorientated? You're in that yeah. space and you don't know where you are. Yeah. What do you do then? I freak. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes, back, it comes back to that, you know, if, if you see a bewildered blind person ask, and, I says, and it may well be just orientating them again to it, because you can get lost. You get utterly... But how do you know you're bewildered? I'd ask. Yeah. So Excuse me. Apart from asking, you could anticipate it somehow. And try and unravel the situation I got myself in by going back the same, the same path until I find myself into familiar surrounds and re reset. That must be very hard to do, going back. Yeah, but that's... But that's 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 my life, you know. It's the the the, the 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 journey, the twilight journey, is all about planning and pre-planning, and it's down to infinitesimal stuff. It may seem stupid, but that is your life. You have to plan. When you go to the pub, you need to know where the toilets are. You need to know the exit. You need to know where the taxi rank is, because okay. it's that sort of level of planning that's going on. James, if you're lost, how do you communicate to Panther that you're lost? I can't. I can't. There's no way. Does I ask. <laughs> but it's not the dog. Panther, where am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just licks me, so there's no... <laughs> so, so it, it, they're fascinating creatures. They're amazing, but um, it's, it, if I could ask you to share with any and all, if they're in harness, ignore them totally. Be happy to integrate with the person, and the person will be, and that's not going to affect the dog at all. But it's that that uh, relationship that you're dealing with, not not the dog. Okay. Are taxis okay with the dog? Yeah, they uh, Where so does the dog sit? between your legs in the passenger seat. Oh. So that's that's. Well, no, yeah, it, it, most, most instances it's okay. Um, they lost too many dogs with bad injuries when they uh, had them on the back seat or in the back of the car. 
and this is the safest way to transport. Yeah. Okay, the last mobility thing that I just want to briefly touch on in um, and for the tech techophiles around us, that's probably the most exciting thing is um, art uh, artificial intelligence and the way in which that's beginning to interact with my life. Um, they're now taking technology from driverless cars and uh, putting it onto mobile phones. So that there's now an app that is there called Seeing AI, which uh, in real time can uh, tell you what's, what's in the room. So, for instance, I, it can use facial recognition componentry in there where I, uh, my wife's in there and I can hold up my phone and scan the room and find Meg and guide me straight into there. Uh, it will read the, um, the barcodes on products, so I can go into my pantry at home and find things very easily. I can go shopping, God knows, I don't want that out. <laughs> I can go shopping where, where basically I can use the barcodes to find the, the right stuff. I know where they are, don't you worry. It's, and it's funny, and it's funny at home, and, and this, is, this is part of this planning I was talking about, and it's, 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 a, it's an important point to make. Um, everything at home has its spot. When it's, when it's finished being used, it goes back to its spot. And that's how I remove some of the pressure off Meg, because I can engage with that. I can put it back, she can put it back. I am an independent person in that space, and she doesn't need to worry about that. So when she's away, I'm a bachelor, quite happily so. Um, but it all comes down to everything has its space, and I know where things are, and I can access them effectively. Okay? So that artificial intelligence, without belaboring the point, that's going to be the next big thing. Um, it's, it's using facial recognition, it's using barcodes, it's using, uh, it will describe scenery to you. Um, so that's, that's where it's going. Uh, it's, it's just unfortunate that some of the ambient noise in some workplace and that aren't, don't, aren't particularly friendly man. So that's the mobility side of it, and I'll just put that to one side, park that. Let's look at the adaptive technology side of it. So um, I often muse that, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I would have been able to do a PhD or work in workplaces or do any of the stuff I do today because of the computer and the technology that goes along with it. So for, for those of you who are interested, basically the computer for me now is the gateway to all my information. And it's, there's a, it employs a piece of software which is screen reading. And without getting too deep on it, screen reading software will take whatever is on the screen and read it to me. And it basically reads from left to right, left to right, left to right. So it's perfect for Word documents, works absolutely brilliantly. In Excel spreadsheets, you can sell across and do all that sort of stuff. You can navigate. Once you've got the, the characteristics of the rows and the columns, you can navigate around spreadsheets easily. Can I make a comment there? I sent James a, a crew list for uh, Winds of Change, and I embedded all the dates with all the crews inside the, inside the email. And I got this lovely email back saying, thanks for the information, Roger, but uh, next time send it as an attachment. So if you are sending James something via Excel, send it as an attachment. Don't get invented. Because mm. apparently it, it becomes a big nightmare with it industry does. reading software. It does. So with, so, um, and I'll talk to the documents in a moment a little bit more. So effectively, this, this piece of software enables me to, to basically access everything off the screen, anything that appears on the screen, it'll read it to me, and it's, it's just wonderful. So I'll get all my journals and newspapers and media, uh, obviously emails and all that type of gear. The phone, uh, the phone is the big, big game changer. Um, I remember my first mobile phone, and, and um, it was a Nokia, um, of some early derivative, a brick, I seem to recall. Um, and when it came to getting the software necessary for me to uh, use it, uh, in terms of it getting to talk to me and uh, GPS, each of those software packages cost between two and a half and three and a half thousand dollars. So six thousand dollars to put onto the phone. Your iPhone has all of that software in, in, embedded in it. So I use VoiceOver, which is embedded in the software system, which again reads everything on the screen to me. 
So for texts, emails, all that sort of stuff, I can get on my phone. Is that app free now? Yes. Yeah, it's part of the operating system. The and the other the other part of it is Siri, which enables me to talk to it and get things. So you'll get short emails and short texts from me when I'm on the phone because I'm using Siri. So that that has just been brilliant. Um, in terms <coughs> of um, so that's the phones, the computers. Um, can't think of anything else on that on that front. In terms of the office space and, and communication, um, I talked to you about um, emails. So my screen reading software will read emails perfectly unless you begin to embed images or tables into it, then it sort of becomes a bit of a nightmare. So emails are no problems. Um, Word documents, no problems, provided they're not um, protected, uh, then you sort of uh, we have some difficulties when we're sort of working on documents together. Excel spreadsheets, no problems. But the big one uh, that uh, we have difficulties with are PDF files. And it's not the PDF file itself, it's the way in which the PDF document is saved. There is a setting with PDFs, and it should be default, I can't understand why this is not done, which is PDF with OCR, OCR enabled, optical character recognition enabled, and what that actually, all that actually means is that the screen reading softwares can actually read the text that is embedded in PDF documents. But more often than not, what a PDF is doing is taking a photographic image of a document. So for me, I believe I'd still be working in a university as an academic quite effectively, bar for the fact that we now have these wonderful huge databases of all the journals and that. And guess what? They're all PDF'd and they're all imaged. So they're all photographed. That's low-hanging fruit as an academic, you can't get to it. So you have to employ someone to make it enable. Not in this day and age you don't. Does the OCR um, disable allow you to con convert the PDF back to uh, back to uh, Word document? Um, it, it, there is a setting that, that, that does that, so you can convert it back. I'm not sure whether that's tied up with OCR, but, but what, what I can tell you is that when it is saved in that manner, I don't need to see it in Word. Oh, it will operate perfectly. Oh, okay. okay. So for letters and short documents, PDF is fine when it's saved in that way. PDF documents of big books and manuals and journals and so on, nightmares to navigate through because it, it operates very laterally and you don't have the means like you do in Word where you can choose headings or pages or chapters or all of that. So you can really dissect it and get quickly into things. Um, are there any questions about that? So that's just office and communication. With so many documents, James, how do you organise your filing system on your PC with folders? Yeah, so... Again, for me, it everything has its place, and I know where things go. And how do I do it? In in File Manager, it's that's all accept accessible using the screen reading software. So Windows Explorer, no problems at all. M Drive, no problems at all. M Drive's not a problem. It's the way in which we have organised our system in M Drive that creates some interest. But that's an entirely other story. Are uh, e-books from, uh, from the iBook store in PDF or do you...? I don't know. Where I have gone is directly for Audible. You've got Audible in the iBooks yep. And uh, my wife's um, mother is an author and she sends uh, documents in Word in the draft format, so I just basically read it. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's Audible. Excuse me, James, what is your time limit? Uh, 2.30, 22. What's the time now? Ten to three. Ten to three. Holy door. Okay, um, let's, sorry, I'll just very quickly go on. Um, okay, the boat. This is where we're getting to. So I've given you, I've given you uh, some of the dimensions of the things that we need to be mindful of. I know for me that I need to take more ownership of myself in that space and communicate clearly to people about that. So when I'm asking inane questions of people, it's not 
questioning you. It's really trying to, <laughs> trying to get an understanding of where things are at or, or how they are placed or where I, how I'm to orientate myself to that. But I'm going to turn it over to you now. From that presentation, what are some of the key messages that you need to work with when you're dealing with clients on the boat that are blind? Talk to them. Ask yeah, them ask, ask them. Yeah. Get to know them. Yeah. Get to know them. And, and to me, it's, it's about ascertaining where they are at so that you can shape the way in which your conversations are moulded to have maximum impact with them at that point in time and how you can develop them positively and make an impact on them. Yeah? What else? I'll pick up the one that Clive mentioned as well. It's something that we probably need to consider when we are taking people out in programs. So I know for many of our Winds of Change now, we talk about me as the token blind fellow, um, which is which is good for two reasons. A, it makes everyone aware, and B, it, it actually it provides them with a, with a sense of, well, something might be possible. Uh, but when it comes to sailing and racing and those sorts of things, I think this needs to actually be written in, that we need to be more aware of those who we are sailing with and so that we are able to more safely navigate the uh, what is essentially a pretty dangerous dangerous environment. What else? James, when you're on um, main sheet and you're trying to learn that, you know, where the wind is, how do you, how do I adjust with the boat, what information is helpful for you or are you just happy to sit there and work it out as you go? Okay. What would you like us to tell you to, to feed into that algorithm? So on whatever, yep. we have the uh, telltales at the back of the, the main yep. and so that gives me a really good way to um, trim the mainsail. Right. Um, and the guy that does that most times is basically t teaching me, he's a blind fellow as well, right. and that's the way in which we, which we adapt. Now, with kale, it's a little more problematic because we're not actually running off the... So for me, where I was experimenting last week when we went out, yep. I'm feeling the wind on the face, I'm feeling the heel on the boat, I'm listening to the helmsman talk, and hopefully I get more talk about what they are doing coming into the wind, away from the wind, all, all that sort of stuff, so that I can work with them more effectively. Yeah. So I need to be tapping into those around me, and they need to be tapping in with me to get the most out of me in those sort of situations. Right. Do you need a random commentary of the, um, the, the telltales? Not, I, I would ask for it. I would ask for but, it. I mean, that, that can change. You know, every second. It, it can, but we're not going to trim a sail every second. Yeah. We're, we're, and you've got the feel of the boat. You know when it's reasonably well trimmed, and then ask the question, where are we at? You know, And, and that sort of feedback enables you to set the sail pretty well. Thanks. But again, it's that awareness and that, that, uh, that willingness to communicate clearly, simply, and effectively. Yep. Yeah, it's very interesting because when, you, you know, when you're sailing offshore at night, Pretty much can't see, mm -hmm. can't see the sails can't properly. Yeah, it's, it's sort of we're kind of sort of going into your world a little bit. It's exactly. all by feel. It's all by feeling where the wind's coming from, and and um, it's interesting. Um, the other the other thing that just struck me, and you know, rather than seeing this as a negative thing, you know, a lot of the safety on board is actually predicated on having everything in its place, yeah. Yeah. and consistently so, and we have checklists to enforce that. And hopefully that's happening. Well, it's not always happening. And so if you want the best out of people, provide them with the opportunity to create the memories. Now, that's not only for me, it's effectiveness for all of you too. Yeah. It's no good scrambling around for the sort of, you know, six-headed screwdriver or whatever that you need to do that job if it's not in its place. I guess I'm the test for all of us because if I can't find it, then it's suggesting there's a breakdown in the system. Absolutely. Anything else? Uh, I, I found it interesting working with you when you have to, just like when we're learning something new, and so say the way that David would teach a group of us sighted people, for you, you're sort of left out because he's pointing to things and you have no idea what it actually is. So to teach someone who is visually impaired 
how to do something on the boat. You have to go about it in a different way. You're describing Correct. how things look. You're getting the person's hands to touch things. And I think yeah, it's a very different way of teaching. You often, when I'm instructing, I often provide a lot of context because that's important for me to give the peop- person I'm training the opportunity to get some of the dimensions so that they can see themselves in that place. Mm-hmm. And I think as I've gone through my journey, that has been more of what, what I've been about and what I've learned. And so it's, it's true, it's a, it's a good observation that it is, you need, I think respectfully and, and nicely and simply, it can be done with description, a lot of this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, being clear, clear in your own mind before you open your mouth, it makes a big difference. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to have to run, but um, I, I'm happy to take any any questions you might have offline. So just just email me or ring me. Happy to happy to continue the conversation at any time with any of you. James, can I offer you a lift somewhere? Oh, no, you can't. I've got a taxi arriving at three o'clock. Okay. So thank you. I appreciate it, though. Thank you. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you.